Welcome to The Bomb Squad. My name is Andrew Hada, and I'm the writer-director of the To Be Hits, Borderland and the Last Ones. They're on Tubi right now, go check them out. It, Tubi, more like Andy, that's the name of the streaming site now because I'm taking over it. Um, yeah, go check it out. We're here with The Bomb Squad with another podcast exclusive. And if you're watching this on YouTube and you're confused why I said podcast exclusive, it just means I'm not going to edit it. Um, so, <laughs> as just per put up YouTube, one image it's, it's just to fill the, the time. Game. Yeah, that's literally that's literally what I did with the Matrix, and it's doing numbers. It's doing mad numbers. And then the people don't in, care. <laughs> in the red letter media thing, they were like, "Oh, what if we call it Matrix Rebooted?" I was like, "Okay, guys." Why don't you copy me more? I know you're one of the 25 viewers that we have so far. Um, so yeah, it's it's literally January 1st when we're recording this. And so we're going to do our top 10 of 2021. Also, I just realized yesterday that the year is now 2022. I thought we were still in 2020 because the pandemic is never ending. Um, so yeah, as we did last year, I'm going to pick my five, Josh is going to pick his five, and then that'll be ten, unless we have uh, crossovers, which we won't because I don't like Marvel movies. Um, the only stipulation that I have is that we're not, we're in the middle of a fucking pandemic, and Omicron is literally infecting 100,000 people a day, so we're not going to do any fucking theaters exclusive. I'm sorry. Spider-Man, but it's not happening. You can kill people on your own. Uh, same thing with <laughs> same thing with Ghostbusters. Neither of you are going on the list, but I have a feeling you aren't going to go on the list anyway. Um, so yeah. So now that I've gotten all that bullshit out of the way, <laughs> this is going to be a good podcast. I'm just yelling. <laughs> yeah, just um, just ranting about public health care and. and I mean, yeah, but let's get into it with the top ten. Movies of 2020, not including the top movies of 2020. <laughs> uh, number 10, or number, my number five is a little film by a podcaster named Dasha. Oh, God, really? <laughs> it's called The Scary of 61st. Wait, is uh, it called that? It, has, it doesn't have, it has a good title, but I just want to make sure it's 61st. Yeah, the Scary of 61st is, um, it's directed by Dasha, I'm, there's no way I'm going to pronounce her name. Nekrova or something like that. Nekrova. And it's about like this, it's this group of girls and they like rent an apartment and they find out that um, Jeffrey Epstein owned it. Former, former uh, Trump and Bill Clinton best friend Jeffrey Epstein. And, uh, so then they like they start like getting these weird hallucinations, and then Dasha shows up as a third girl who's been investigating Epstein for a while, um, and then like yeah, it's just ghost stuff, just ghost things. Josh, have you seen this movie? No, I have not. I've seen the trailer. You cut. <laughs> so, um, yeah. No, I, mean, I, I haven't seen it. Yeah. On. On the Bomb Squad, we always like to talk about a movie that has potential. And I feel like this movie had a lot of potential. Um, it, like, because, I mean, it's an interesting idea. Like, there's a bunch of property all over New York City and probably the world. It's probably going to be owned by Jeffrey Epstein or his friends or his pals, every celebrity in Hollywood. Um, this is also a good start with me wanting to be a director. And <laughs> well, it's so a lot of politicians like, and stuff too. It's actually more political than Hollywood, yeah, but you it's know, more, it's more Elon. I'm not even going to finish that. Um, <laughs> Elon, who, it could be anyone. Anyone. Elon, could have. Elongated man from DC <laughs> comics. What I was trying to say, guys, I'm not going to get sued. All I saw is pictures, but anyway, so yeah, it's like these two girls, they go to, um, they rent. They start renting the house, and then like one of the girls is like sexually repressed, and then the other girl is just there, <laughs> and like what the the sexually repressed girl starts getting like these weird kind of like hallucinations where she's like starting to act differently, like she's possessed, 
And like at one point she has like this boyfriend and at one point like they're having sex and she's like, yeah, I want you to fuck me like you're like I'm 13 years old. And like that's an interesting idea. Like you become so obsessed with the Epstein case. Like again, the the big thing about Epstein wasn't that he was a child trafficker. It's that he was friends with literally everyone, you know? Yeah, and every, like, high-ranking person. Yeah. yeah, and it becomes this weird thing where, like, I was reading something about one actor who went on a plane and he, like, went to an event. And it was just, like, a normal event. And, like, you, he just met a bunch of other celebrities and then he, like, left the island. But it's like, A, how do you know he's telling the truth? And B, I bet you that happened a lot. Like, I bet you there was, like, times where Epstein was, like, feeling people out. And he would like, oh, yeah, let's go to a party. And then you go to a party and he's like, hey, that girl looks hot. And you're like, that's a child. And he's like, all right, I'll see you later. You know, yeah. so like. But, that was but, like the weird thing, though. Like he he was like charged like pretty early in the 21st century. So it's like people kind of publicly knew he did sex crimes for like over a decade before it was like, oh, now he's getting arrested for it. It's like, oh, OK, now it's not OK. That, you I know, mean, that's, that's true. But also think about how many celebrities have like i mean certain politicians have multiple sexual harassment plans too. yeah I'm, I'm not gonna blame actors and actresses i'm just talking about like the other like billionaires he would hang out with it's like you guys knew he, he was doing this you know yeah so. it's a little grimy right buddy yeah, i know you know what i'm talking about um so yeah so like it's an interesting idea like you become so obsessed with like this epstein thing that you like start thinking like oh yeah the only way to um the only way that i'm gonna get like the truth is if i start like testing men about how they all like children which obviously isn't true but it's like it's an interesting idea because it does become, you like, you like fetishize like, your obsession it is interesting actually yeah yeah it's a cool it's idea very interesting and it's a cool idea and dasha like she has a certain like she has a style that she's going for um but I do think that she just needed to make more stuff because it feels like, in a lot of ways, it feels like a first time movie. Like every character talks like Dasha when she does interviews. And then um, like there's just characters that don't really make sense and that like motivations change every two seconds. So, you know, it just has a lot of amateur problems. Not like I, I don't have those problems as evidenced <laughs> by... Movies on Tubi, go check them out, guys. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I do think that she it's worth a watch, especially, like, with how relevant it is, you know? And, like, I kind of wish that she had left the ghost stuff behind and kind of dived straight into, like, how these conspiracy theories, even when they're true, can, like, lead you down this troubling road of, like, psychosis. Like, if you think about Pizzagate, like, Pete's the core idea of Pizzagate is super insane like there's no there's no sex dungeon child in pizza, pizza sex dungeon yeah yeah no because that doesn't it doesn't even have a basement but <laughs> there are like a lot of politicians who got caught up in this prince uh, prince uh prince parties that they were having at this creepy ass island and then like if you look at epstein's island i'm sorry we're going into a rant about epstein i'm trying not to but if you look at epstein's <laughs> island he had like a lot of weird he had, like a lot of weird shit like i understand you're a sex trafficker and you're like bribing or you're getting blackmail on these politicians but you didn't have to build like a weird temple they look like a temple to, in to like Moloch. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, I don't even know. It's like one of those things where it's like, you almost think he was doing it tongue in cheek as a bored, rich yeah. sex criminal that he's exactly. like, Oh, wouldn't it be funny if I like went all in on it? I don't know. It's almost yeah, like, like, to me, it's like the evil version of Alan Moore, like worshiping the snake God, just as a joke. It's like these evil billionaires are also doing it as a joke. You know? Yeah. Or it's like when, <laughs> it's like when potheads like get really into Snoop Dogg, even though they like all the other music they like is like Bob Dylan and the other like weed stuff. And it's like, you know, you don't have to do this. <laughs> yeah. But like, but the thing that he was super into was child trafficking. Yeah. So there's definitely like, there. There could have been a movie there that would have been, like, super cool and especially, like, relevant. Now, just... I don't know if you're doing, like, full-on spoilers, but is there, like, ghosts and, like, you know, metaphysical stuff in it? Or is it just one of those, like, oh, it's, like, 
only up for interpretation. You don't know type of things. They kind of do both. It's like they it could go either way. And just... Yeah. And, you know, there's a scene at the end where you meet one of Epstein's colleagues. I mean, not in real life, but in the like in the movie, it's like the guy's playing like an Epstein. It's just Bill Gates Epstein playing Cole. himself. <laughs> it's a weird cameo by uh, a New York a New York director. Um, and yeah, so like that scene was super cool. And that's what like, I mean, there's there's a lot of good in this movie. I think that um, the reviews that are calling it garbage are just wrong. I also think the reviews that are like loving it are uh, seeing more of the, the good than the faults. But I think, I definitely think it's worth watching. And it was more interesting than... Uh, you know, you can watch it at your house and not catch coronavirus to see fucking nostalgia thrown at your face as a weapon. But yeah, scary of 61st. Go watch it. Um, Josh, what's your number five? Well, as long as we're doing number five in the junk bin. <laughs> my number five was Venom. Let there be carnage. Oh, my number now. one is Venom. <laughs> is Venom. it really? No, I don't know. I don't know my number one. Oh, no, it's not. But Venom <laughs> is at the top of the list. Okay. Well, I, okay, like, and I, I definitely saw more than five movies better than Venom this year, but I think what I really, like, appreciated about it and why I feel like it deserved to be on the list is that even, I don't hate Marvel movies like you do, <laughs> but it is one of those things where the formula gets so stale that you're like, okay, even if I like this movie, I know beat for beat every single scene that's going to happen. And Venom is so not structured in any way that any superhero ever has been. And it, and I don't even know how intentional it was. I know this is one of those things where it's like, oh, it's during the strike. And like Tom Hardy kind of like worked out the story himself, but it's like, it's such a breath of fresh air like as a superhero film to not like hit all the same beats that every other superhero film you've seen in the last like 10 years has done. You know what I mean? Yeah, no. And that's honestly why I, um, like um, there's none, there's not even like an action or a fight scene for like the first hour of the movie. And it's like, I respect it that you're just like, Oh, we don't need that. This is all character work between Tom Hardy and Venom. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'll say. Like, again, like I'm, I'm very harsh on Marvel on these things, but that's only because Marvel movies, they're so safe. Like I saw that Shang Shea movie. They don't like, try anymore. Yeah. Yeah. There's like, um, there's like a scene where they're on the bus and it's super cool. And I was like, oh, man, this movie is actually doing, like, good action. But then, like, the other character, like, takes out a laser hand or something. And then, like, it just turns into a CGI fest. And it's like, you can tell that it's just in there to, um, because, like, they, they're like, oh, no, you can't just have a normal fight scene in this movie with, like, practical effects. It has to, like, the bus has to be tipping over. And it's like, why? Like, that's the cool thing about Venom is that, it's still in the basic framework of a um, it's in the basic framework of these of these Marvel movies, but it, it has such a, its own identity that it's it like makes up for like the basic premise. Like they're like that movie is oozing personality where Shang Chi is yeah, like it's so, so just... Oh man, I'm I'm starting to get into this I'm starting to get into this characters. Oh, here's Here's the fucking guy from Iron Man 3. He's a joke. He's a joke cameo. Oh, here's uh, Abomination. And it's like, for fans of the stuff, I guess they love it. And Disney knows they love it. So Disney's like giving them what they want. Yeah, and they, they like, kind of like, they like section it off though in Marvel movies where it's like, oh, here's the joke scene. And now here's like the kind of medium fight scene. And then here's like the getting ready for the big fight. It's like, Whereas in Venom, it's like, no, here's like Tom Hardy playing two sides of an abusive relationship for like 45 yeah. minutes. And like, and then just arguing with himself, but it's so good. Like, he he's having so much fun that it's like infectious, you know? Yeah. And it's like when I'm watching, like, it's weird that in Shang-Chi, and I don't mean to be constantly. This, <laughs> That's like the last one you saw, right? So yeah. I get it. It's weird that in Shang-Chi, like, he, like, there's a girl and she's his best friend. But she's kind of his love interest, but they never go further than that. And I've like, is Marvel ever going to have two characters kiss? I don't understand what the problem is anymore where they can't be in love. And it's just like a weird, it's a, the only one that's been in love is 
Tony Spider Man. Oh yeah, I has, guess Spider Man. Yeah, he has Mary Jane. I can guarantee you, if Marvel had made Iron Man now, Tony Stark would not have a girlfriend. Yeah, probably true. She would be like his best friend, and she would be like, "Oh, I'm, I'm sarcastic." Yeah, they they might quit romantically at each other. Or do you actually yeah. remember Doctor Strange does have movie. a love interest that I don't think he ever like yeah, he never brings her up again. seems to have affection toward. Yeah, and they just, even yeah. in the newer movies, like when they did, like Thor has a love interest, and we haven't seen her in like three movies. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's because they got Natalie Portman. Natalie Portman's like, I'm not doing this for less than a million dollars, but still. Uh, but then I'm like, yeah, he has a love interest. They kind of resolve that plot without like it being asexual. Like he still loves her, but she's moved on, which would he, make sense. He has to learn to love himself. Uh, know? Woody Harrelson has a love interest. He plays <laughs> Carnage, and his girlfriend has a love interest. And like every character just feels like they've come into their own. No there characters. is there is a great Cedar Liot at Venom. Speaking of Woody Harrelson, where he's he's like he's been locked up in an insane asylum since he was a young kid. And they have this young actor just using Woody Harrelson's voice. Oh, and like, oh I love like the like the, the cheesy yeah. like kind of effects. Or like, nah, just do it. It's fine. It's a superhero movie. It's fun. It's like the know? second movie I've seen where they do that and it's never worked. And I think it's hilarious every time. Because it's like, no, this guy sounds like an old Woody Harrelson man. It doesn't sound like a little kid. Yeah. Um, and I think like, yeah, it's just like Woody Harrelson's there. It just like feels... Like you're involved, it, you're having fun with it, and also it's only ninety minutes. And uh, that's like, the best part. It just cuts out all the chaff, you know. Yeah, people are like mad about we're mad about it being ninety minutes, and I'm like, no, that's good. Like if if your movie has not like if it's just a fun time and it doesn't really have anything to say, that's fine. I'm not gonna sit through two hours of it. Like if you want me to sit through two hours of it, you better have fucking something to say. And it better not be that bad guys are bad. Yeah, there's very um, few there's very few justifications for two plus hour movies, especially like like action movies. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, I just really liked Venom. I thought it was a lot of fun. I thought it had a lot of personality, and I thought that it was worth it was worth watching. Yeah, and, uh... um, and yeah, Woody Harrelson does a good job. Tom Hardy, Michelle. Williams, it's it's all good. Everything is good. I didn't like the directing as much because it's Andy Serkis, and I don't think he knows how to do that good at directing yet. But I, I almost like the it. um, it's very shaky in that way. Like it, it kind of is just like oh, it's like it's funny because you're like oh, um, scary sixty first is like her first movie figuring out. This almost felt like them figuring out how to do superhero movie on their own, you know? Like Tom Hardy's like, I'll handle the script, don't worry, you know? And it's like, yeah. you, know, you almost love it for its faults a little bit, you know? Yeah, and I think that's what it is. And I think that's why there, it's kind of like, hold on, let me figure out something. Yeah, it was like originally I had Fast 9 on here. And I think there's like this love of, like people love to hate on the Fast Five year, uh, franchise, but they like to hate on it because it it is what it is. Like no, they're all the moves are made. It's like they're all moving chess pieces. It's, I mean, sure the chess pieces are like they have turbo lifts on them and they're multicolored, but it's still every move is a chess piece. And I think like the same thing with Venom, where it's like there's no scene in Venom where I'm like, oh, they made, oh, there is an end credit scene that's definitely like they made this for the studio made them do this. Yeah, for that part's not scene, great, but you knew they had it was so mandated, like obviously, you know. Yeah. So, but it was like you just want to like hang out in that world, and I think that it's I think we should applaud, especially blockbusters right now that are trying to do their own thing and making you like feel like it has a personality as opposed to trying to copy the Iron Man personality. Um, so yeah, Venom, great movie. Go watch it. Uh, what's your number? Oh, is it my turn? Your number four, yeah. My number four is The French Dispatch <laughs> by Wes Anderson. So like, here's the thing, again, kind of talking about what we were just talking about. Um, it's the same thing where like, I know a lot of people are like, why does Wes Anderson just make the same type of movie all the time? But the way Wes Anderson makes movies is so unique and so different. Like we shouldn't be asking why he keeps making these movies. We should be like happy that he gets, we get to live in his mind for two 
hours every two years, you know? I agree. I mean, for the most part, obviously, um, he has a few like weaker entries. And I should clarify that The Royal Tenenbaums is my favorite movie of all time. It's the first I'm hearing of it. Getting getting that out there. Uh, I will say this movie is not on my top five for various reasons. And I don't know if you want to. Well, see, the French, the French Dispatch, it's written like a like a magazine because it's it's about the it's about this magazine in Kansas City, which does not look anything like Kansas City. And um, Bill Murray plays the managing editor and he's just died. So this is the last issue. And in his will, he like specified that this issue would be the last one. So they're kind of like putting it together. And so you're seeing it. It's like a bunch of vignettes. It's making up the magazine. And I think this is the first time, like he's always had an ensemble cast, but this is the first time that like so much of them, like they, they've been this disconnected. And I yeah, think... it's it's super like segmented. And I, I almost feel yeah. like that's what it's like. Because a lot of times it's like a structure within a structure. Like uh, the Grand Budapest was like, a girl reading a book written by the guy who interviewed the old man who was the child from the Grand Budapest. And this one's like, it's Bill Murray like editing. And then it's every one of their articles. And then what happens in the article and um, possibly like a talk they gave on it later is like the framing of that article, which sounds exhausting when I say it like this. And and it's kind of, I don't know. I feel like it's almost like the framing overpowers it a bit because every story is interesting in it. But, like, they're so separate that they don't, like, I don't know, you don't get that, like, giddy sense of, like, things intertwining. You know what I mean? Well, see, I'm going to have to disagree with you because my only problem is that every story isn't interesting. There's one that has Timothy Chalamet, and he's, like, playing, like, this kid, and there's, like, a revolution. And honestly, that's probably the worst thing. That <laughs> it's it's the ever. weakest link, but it's, it's still, so I mean, bad. Frances McDormand's still good in it. I mean, she's good. I mean, they're all good in it because it's yeah, characters. But Jesus true. Christ, who, like I completely like tuned out during that part to the point where I was like, <laughs> "What the hell is going on?" Because every other part of the movie is so good, <laughs> and that yeah. part it just brings it to a standstill. And I don't even like they're like doing a revolution, but like it's none of the it's characters it's like a co- I think it's it's kind of like a commentary on like student anarchist like activism where it's like oh it's all kind of the most important thing but it's not really that important you know I don't know yeah. I mean I I got that out of it but yeah it's definitely not as good as um the prisoner or the the chef in the last one yeah the like, prisoner one is great because it's like Benicio del Toro plays a prisoner and he's just like a modern artist and they like. It's just like this quirky artist that's in prison. And yeah, it's just a, full of funny characters. Uh, Leia Sidhu is, 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 is his, his great love slash the prison guard. Yeah. And like Adrian Brody. It's funny, like you wouldn't think that Adrian Brody would fit in the Wes Anderson world, but he fits in it so perfectly. <laughs> that yeah. It's like, you're like, yeah, I don't know why you haven't been in this earlier. And like Edward Norton also doesn't fit in the world, but they always put him in there and he always works. <laughs> I think they're just friends, you know, it's good times. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it is a good movie. It's just definitely, it's one of those things where it's like, uh, I'm almost frustrated because I love the prisoner part and I, and I love the, like the last one where it's the, the chef, you know? And it's almost like, I almost wish you just made this one big story about like the prisoner and like the police were like the guards or something. I don't know. It's like, it's like, I almost don't want you to separate it like this because it doesn't give everything time to just kind of hang out. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So. And again, speaking of movies that you should have watched in theaters, you sh- this is a movie that I think like, there's always that like, well, why didn't you go watch Spider-Man? You need to see it in theaters. But to me, CGI actually looks better on a smaller TV because you don't notice how bad some of it is. That can be true, yeah. Especially with Marvel when they stopped giving a shit like a while ago. (laughs) Um, And so, like, but this movie where it's like every every inch of the frame is important to Wes Anderson to the point where he's cut it off and made it into a square. That's the kind of movie I want to see in a theater, like, so I can pay attention to all the details. It it is definitely, it's him and his most success because there is two different plain cross sections to this movie and what is like you didn't even need to build this full cross section you'd never even zoom in on it you just thought it was cool yeah but that's what i like about again that's yeah. what I'm saying. like he was having no a else, good time no one else is doing it like him and i think that we should be reveling in it 
Okay. That is true. And that, that is one of those things where people are very much like, oh, all indie movies are the same. It's like, I wish other indie directors did movies like this because that he wouldn't be the only like game in town for this type yeah. of movie, you know? So Josh, what's your number four? This is a bit of a sleeper. And this is kind of one of those things where you probably don't even remember seeing it this year because of how long 2021 was. But I, I wanted to give props to Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar. Oh man, I love Barb and Star. It's such a <laughs> funny movie. That is, I this, told you to watch Barb and Star. I did, and I and I loved it. Um, it's just one of those movies. It's so rare now to see like a wacky comedy that's just like kind of in the vein of Austin Powers, where it's like silly in this way. And I think that's why I wanted to put it on the list because I was like, this is like. They don't make a lot of movies like this anymore. Yeah, you know? it definitely has that like Adam's Family values, uh, Wayne's World kind of like it's the real world, but not really. Like once you like you think that it's like, oh, it's just these two characters who are weird. But as you learn more about the world, you're like, oh, no, it's everyone. <laughs> yeah. um, like it's like it's like, OK, and I guess we should probably break it down a little bit. There's two there's two middle aged best friends who work yeah. together at, like a furniture it's store, a Barb and Star. Movie. Yeah. But there's also a supervillain who um, has like an underground bunker in Vista Del Mar where they're going on vacation, Vista Del Mar, Florida. And she's, I don't even remember what her scheme is. It doesn't matter. It's not the kind of movie where the plot's that important. Yeah. But yeah, it's just like they're there. And then she has a henchman who's like trying to seduce them. And uh, I don't know. It's just, I almost don't want to give too many spoilers because it's like, just yeah. go in blind because it's very funny and it's very like, oh yeah, they don't like, this is not a movie. You, like if you saw this, you'd be like, oh, they didn't release this 15 years ago. It's like, no, this came out this year. And, you know? Yeah. And I don't want to ruin it either because it is so much better when you go in blind and you don't realize what it's about because the yeah. plot is a lot different than you would think. But one of the things that I will say is that it kind of shows you how versatile and amazing um, Christina or Kristen Wiig is because she, um, I mean, she plays two characters and it's just so funny. And one of them is just like amazing. I didn't even realize it was her. Um, but yeah, it's so good. And like it kind of, people were like when Ghostbusters came out and I like the Ghostbusters movie. But I think what was missing from it was Kristen Wiig. Like, she starred in it, but she didn't write it. Yeah. And and you I could definitely tell her, when that did the difference there. Yeah. Yeah. Her writing is so sharp and so good that you kind of like, I wish that she had written Ghostbusters because I think it would have been a very different movie. And I think it would have been, you know, and I liked it. But I think like Kristen Wiig has that like golden touch where she can make the absurdity look good. And I think that, um, that you sh- like that Ghostbusters kind of needs that nice touch and barb and star like i don't think she even wants to do a movie like ghostbusters um but barb and star is kind of like that crazy go for it comedy and i, I loved it yeah it was really good yeah um yeah. so with no spoilers yeah i mean i guess <laughs> so much but yeah it is it's definitely the probably the funniest movie i saw this year probably the funniest movie i've seen in a while like years it's probably the funniest movie i've seen in years yeah, yeah. okay let's go to my number four Three? No, three. my number three. No, four, four. No, yeah, you're three. You're three. Yeah, doing Venom has thrown me off because that was my number. <laughs> oh, that I'll was your... my number three. Are you just going to tag in like an alternate number three then? Because we already talked uh, about so, Venom. Well, no, I'll do that. Okay, so my number three is Venom. Um, And then, so I'll say, instead of actually talking about Venom, I'll just say, go watch Fast 9 and stop being elitist, you, you dumbos. It's good. Go there's watch. Fast... Go watch the MCU for adults. There's, yeah, there's a there's there fast the Fast and the Furious franchise is the MCU for Latinos. Also, I won't say anything like because we're uh, we're actually running pretty behind because we've been talking about these movies so much. I will say that in Fast Nine, Vin Diesel, who's not sure what his race is, he's always said it's pretty ambiguous, but he thinks there's some Latino in it. He cast. Like a six foot tall Mexican guy to play young <laughs> Vin Diesel, <laughs> despite the fact that Vin Diesel's like five feet tall and he's like not. I and, mean, he might be Latino, and but he's his not brother Latino. is John Cena, right? And his brother is John Cena, and it's oh my god, it's so it's <laughs> Chef's kiss, like. The Rock, it's so crazy The Rock doesn't want to do it because it's like, just do it. It's so fun. Like, 
And that's the thing. It's like you see these movies where like Vin Diesel every year is like, oh, I think we're going to get an, uh, like a Best Picture nominee. And like he's not joking around or he's not like – he literally thinks these movies are amazing and they are. And it's just like I love that he's so passionate about this franchise and it really makes me passionate about it. So, yeah. Since I, I got my three taken away, go see Fast 9. It was great. It's not as good as the last couple, but it's building back up. And The Rock better do the right thing. And he start probably, these movies. He Nobody probably wants won't. to watch fucking Red Notice Part 2. And that's from someone who almost... I was going to say, you office. do. You like Red no, Notice. No, I don't, I don't want to see... I don't ever want to see sequels unless they're fast. And unless they're furious. Um, also, just one more thing. In Tokyo Drift, the main character is like a high school student who's just a high school student. And also, he's kind of dumb. But now... He's building rocket ships <laughs> with little Bow Wow <laughs> because every move, every character in his movie has to have like a secret spy power. It's like when you got the He-Man toys and they all had like a secret, like, oh, this one does a punch if you press this button or this one actually stinks. That's how all the characters are written in the Fast <laughs> It's like, remember that guy? Talent. Yeah. Yeah. Remember that guy who was stealing car tires in the first movie? Well, now he's come back, and he's a he's a laser he's a laser expert who can get through any minefield. It's like what? <laughs> Again, these movies are amazing. Okay, Josh, what's your number three? Uh, number three is Dune. Got to go with Dune. Did we already Dune talk about for, Dune on the podcast? Dune for number three? Are you dumb? I you know I I give Dune credit for two things. One, did we talk about this on the podcast? I don't think so. Maybe. We've never talked about Dune because our podcast isn't about Dune. <laughs> um, we saw you and I saw the David Lynch movie, and and you're I know this is a, a podcast about finding the good in things, but the David Lynch movie is dog shit, and he'll tell you the same. So I'm allowed to say it because even the director <laughs> agrees. The David Lynch movie is so bad that it made me not actually like Dune after I like bought the book and was playing area. I was like, I'm just not going to read it now. Like this is terrible. This movie completely reversed my opinion. I'm like, Oh, Dune can be good and approachable. And like, you can go in blind and enjoy it. It's just like a big, like summer, like tentpole movie, despite the fact that it's the most complicated, esoteric, asinine, like sci-fi, like concept ever. You know what I mean? Yeah, I will say that, okay, before we start, I, I do want to point out that this movie clearly should have starred Muslims. It's weird that it's about Muslims in space, but they it's hired like a bunch mean, of white people. Kind like, of. Don't, don't do that. I don't know if, like, like that was I his mean, intent. Yeah, in the books, they're Muslim, and they also literally do, like, the jihad on people in the next one. The Butlerian jihad, though, not the yeah. The like if I do, if I do the fucking uh, <laughs> the plut- the Plutarian rosary, it's the fucking rosary. Like higher fucking Catholic. Well, I, I do get that to an extent, but th- this is also she, like the, the she fact really that he has like the things written on her face. But he's not supposed to be like the the entire thing isn't like oh man he's fulfilling his destiny. It's like no, this group of like, like this elite cabal has manufactured him as like a fake prophet and he's just like going along with it. So him being a white person is astute in that case because that's what would happen. Yeah, I guess, but it's like you could have just put a Muslim in this. (laughs) Well. Um, And hotter. Uh, But I will say that one of the things is like, yeah, there's scenes that are almost like the same, but... When you watch him in this one and then you watch him in David Lynch's, like he gets extra points. It's Dennis uh, Valeria or whatever. Villanueva. He, Villanueva. How did I not get that? Um, <laughs> he, he, does, he gets like extra points for not only making the scenes good, like the scene where they put the hand in the box. Like they not only did he make it good, but he made you forget how bad it was in the original tune. Yeah, like I like I just remembered the movie, and then uh, I was watching it with like Stephanie was going in completely blind, you know, um, and but she still like got it. And then it's like I'm watching this like dreading scenes that are coming up. I'm like, oh, this scene's gonna suck so bad. I'm like, oh no, this is actually like a cool idea. Yeah, because sticking a hand in a box should be a terrible scene, <laughs> and the yeah, fact that it's not, it. yeah, it's so good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it like it works. Like there was moments in there where I felt like when I watched Star Wars for the first time, 
where you're just like into it and you know that it's like this fantastical world that you've never been to but um you just like want to live there for a long time <laughs> you know like even i know i mean i liked avatar but i never got that star wars sense because i always like i was always kind of like in the back of my head i always knew that it was i was watching computer animated images you know yeah and in and in dune i don't ever know what was computer animated and what wasn't i mean there's some stuff like the worm obviously but it looks so good and that you're like in it and there's such a good mix of practical effects with real effects that i mean with cgi effects that you don't ever feel like you're watching a movie you feel like you're being told the story it, it, get, yeah, it gives you that same sense of wonder of like yeah. seeing like a new hope kind of like yeah. in, in that sense yeah no I, no i meant i meant attack of the clones no um <laughs> Yeah, it's so good. And it, like, I mean, I understand that it's pretty much the prologue to a story is where it ends. <laughs> but even then, like, I'm so excited for the next one. And this is from someone who wasn't, who hasn't been as big a fan of Villanueva's work as other people. Yeah, I was going to say, it, this is one of those things, too, where I was also apprehensive going in because people raved about Blade Runner uh, 2047. And that movie has so many problems, we shouldn't even bring it up. That yeah. But people loved it. And I was like... This is a mess. I don't know if you can get like you can nail down something even more like complicated and vast. And it's like, how did he do like a much better job of making this approachable than Blade Runner? You know, I know. And like, it's much more complicated and well done. It's just real good. The only yeah, the only problems is that, yeah, I think that and also has Jason Momoa just being hot. It also has like <laughs> the hottest cast where, again, the only downside is that Timothy kid. It's like, hey, you're a twink. This the most attractive boy in Hollywood. You're saying he shouldn't be there with oh, the you mean Robert Benson. <laughs> um, no, I just think that, like, I mean, Oscar Isaac's there and Jason Momoa's there. It's like, <laughs> come on. Um, but I, I do think that they should have ended it like as they escape. There's like a scene where he fights someone in Javier Bardeen's group and it just kind of feels like okay that that, that, that does movie. very much feel like the, the tension is over, but I don't know. I still yeah. appreciate and obviously part of the this is like okay is part two gonna retroactively just not work and then make part one bad by yeah. association like crank two does or is it just gonna just be this perfect like dual movie set we'll see yeah we're we're on, we're at the force awakens point of the dune movies where it's we'll, like we'll, we'll see, see in, where it goes in 2027 in 2029 when covid um, has just delayed it several also years. it's kind of funny because i i do i like i'm not I do think that that Timothy guy's overhyped, but every time I watch him, I'm like, this guy's not overhyped. He's a great actor. And then I watched Fresh Dense Patch, and I was like, oh, that's right. So, yeah, yeah, well, but it's again, it's like they, they cast him as an unlikable guy in that. And then I saw Don't Look Up, and I was like, oof. I haven't seen that, so I was like, honeymoon. "There's, there's no way this movie's gonna be on my top anything list." So I'm just honeymoon <laughs> phase is over, buddy boy. <laughs> no, I got uh, but no, he's a good actor. I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, Dune is great. And I would have put it on my list, but I knew Josh was going to put it on his. So I was like, fuck it. I'm not going to put it on mine. Um, what number are we at? Your, your number three. No, my number two. Oh, um, right. Yeah. So guys, <laughs> I don't like when movies are longer than 90 minutes unless they earn it. And that's why not my number two is a little film by Zachary Snyder. Oh no! Called the Justice League. <laughs> I really didn't know if you. Were, I was like, he's gonna put F Fast Nine or a, Justice League, not both. Second, this is the <laughs> second time I get to put the Justice League on a top ten list. <laughs> oh no! I mean, I don't. We talked about it. It's it's much better than the first did we do one. A review the just. Oh, we did do a review. Yeah, I mean, it's podcast exclusive. It guys. fixes it's every problem with the first movie so while good. also being four and a half hours. So you, you should almost yeah. never watch it in one sitting. But I mean, I can. It's kind of like the Irishman, where I could just put it on, have it have it playing. Check out these hot bods. Oh my god, I just realized, do I just like hot buff guys and that's how I pick my movies? This is the third one. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's good. It's it's definitely going for something more than just the typical superhero stuff, which again, you always get props in my book. And I just think that Zach, like the fact that he fought for it for years, like people talk shit about him and I understand that some of his fans are toxic. Like, A, have you met the fucking Harry Potter fans or the Star Wars fans? 
or the fucking Spider-Man fans who are currently uh, ravishing our country with fucking Omicron. But B, that's what you like. It's the same thing with fucking Dasha's film and Fast Nine and you know ben, all my films that I've picked so far. I want the director who's going to fight for years to get his version of the movie made. You want the director who's going to think that his movie where Tyrese goes to space is going to win best picture. Like you want him to be like begging the rock, even though the rock is kind of a dick to like be in his movie just because he wants to make the best movie possible for his audience. Like that's what you want out of any artist. And just because they're making movies about superheroes or fucking flying cars doesn't mean that their uh, artistic value isn't like worth it. So even, I mean, we've talked enough about the plot and about the themes. And I just wanted to say that like, yeah, Vin, I'm Vin Diesel, uh, Zack Snyder fighting for his movie, for his dream project and getting it done and it turning out to be good. That's not a bad thing. That's a great thing that we should all be striving for. Granted, he should have told his fans that they're annoying as fuck, but I mean, whose fans aren't annoying as fuck? I mean, you want the creator who's going to try to do stuff. And I think that Zack Snyder is, I mean, he's hes kind of a oof, if we're being honest. But you don't have to be a genius to be a good artist. You just have to believe in your own art. And these guys from Vin Diesel to Dasha to Zack Snyder, they believe in their own art. And I think that that's important. I think that we should be striving to achieve that. So... Good job, guys. You did you did a great job and go watch Justice League. Maybe in breaks, because it is fucking it long. Is. They do they do segment into like four chapters or something, so you actually have you a lot of good watch it chapter points. by chapter if you want. <laughs> yeah. Space okay, it out your, over like a five days. My what's number your number two? two? My number two is Pig. Oh, I didn't watch that one. I wanted to, but then it just seems depressing. It is quite quite depressing um but it's i don't know it's depressing this way one it is about portland and the portland restaurant industry it's it's i'm already gonna give it higher props because portland is you know the city where my heart is um but it, it white supremacy <laughs> in that movie? i didn't know that you know, Portland's not just white, so they're mostly outside of the city. Most of them come from Vancouver. But there's this, I mean, I mean, it's definitely, it's about grief, and it's kind of about like that, and it's, it's like this like kind of melancholy like movie, but it also does this good job of kind of capturing the, uh, the kind of like current 20th century, 21st century, like struggle with like, oh, climate change is probably gonna destroy everything soon, and just like, being like, yeah, but you still have to like live your life. You know, it's like you can't just sit around being like sad about it and everything. I, I don't want to give too much away. I mean, it's it's about he's searching for his pig. The pig is barely in it, so don't think it's going to be a pig heavy movie, <laughs> despite the title. But yeah, it's 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 definitely one of his best performances in years to Nicolas Cage because it's not like the typical him like losing it and screaming at things and going crazy. It's very, like, subdued. Um, well, and I think that that's the thing. It's kind of like Al Pacino, where Nicolas Cage is in this weird role where everyone wants, like, the the crazy Nicolas Cage. But he's, like, people forget how good he is. I mean, we're going to do Bringing Out the Dead eventually, but people forget how good he is at just being these subdued characters. Yeah, yeah. And so like, yeah, it's like yeah, like Al Pacino in the Irishman. Where it's like no, he's a real actor. Like he does other things than his crazy like angry guy skit. And this this is like kind of like proving it. Um, yeah, it's it's good. It's like I said, I don't want to give too much away. It's definitely a sad movie. So if you're like you know, buckle up for it to to be kind of a depressing time, but in a good way. Like it makes you kind of feel like double, cleansed. Do the double feature with uh, Barb and Star and then after pick. So you feel better. Yeah. That might, that might that, be that good. Movie, there's no way you can be sad if you watch that. Movie. <laughs> yeah. This is the the yeah. two, the two diametric ends of the film spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like that movie's <laughs> on everyone's list. Um, it's on a lot of lists end of the year. So I think it's worth a watch. I'm definitely going to watch it. I was actually going to watch it today. Because we were originally going to do our episode tomorrow, but 
things so change. It's kind of one of those things, too, where it's like things are so depressing that I could totally see why you wouldn't want to be like, oh, now this movie will remind me of how depressing everything is. And it's like, yeah, I could see like why watch... you don't want to do that at certain times. But I don't want to I don't like to watch depressing movies by myself. Yeah, that's, so that's what I was waiting for to watch it with someone else. But then COVID got COVID scares got to me. So I had to take an isolated until I got my test results back. Yeah, take that, Spider-Man. You couldn't beat Omicron. But yeah, so number one is Ghostbusters Afterlife. I'm just kidding. Um, my number one is The Night House. The, the Night House. House? Yeah, it's a movie about Rebecca Hall. And it's about a girl who's just lost... Josh, tell me if this sounds familiar. It's about a girl. She just lost her husband after he was killed. And then she she starts talking to a ghost that she <laughs> oh. thinks is her husband <laughs> and it might not be so you like to hire budget movie of your film <laughs> yeah guys watch the empty space um yeah i mean it's very similar to my film if you watch it hopefully it'll be out this year but i mean it was well done and i just like i don't know i like ghost stories or horror movies where a lot of the movie is like uh uh like a detective story like the empty space isn't as much a detective story like we we just kind of throw you in there this one's more of her trying to figure out what exactly is in her house and if it's a ghost and everything amy andrews just kind of falls hook line and sinker in the empty space but she so she's trying to figure out what exactly is going on in her house and what her husband was up to before he killed himself and stuff and also i mean rebecca hall is probably one of our greatest actresses that is working right now because she can she can play like super unhinged without making you like there's uh there's that movie Hereditary with um who's the girl in Hereditary? Oh uh, god, don't put me on the spot. Um I know who you're talking about, but I can't remember her name. Uh but yeah, the girl from Hereditary, <laughs> or even um Florence Fugue in that other movie. Florence uh, Pugh, yeah. She like she spends half the time crying and it is kind of annoying. But I mean, even, even though I understand why she's crying, I, mean, I get it. I still find it kind of annoying. <laughs> she, she has a bad um, but, she she has a bad boyfriend in that movie. Yeah, everyone has a bad boyfriend, honey. Get over it. Um, <laughs> but like, what's her face? Oh, Rebecca Hall is able to Tony Collette. Thank you. It's Tony Collette, and she's like constantly yelling at people and kind of being a bad person. And again, you understand it. But there's a certain thing that Rebecca Hall is able to do where she's able to be likable while also like having a breakdown. And it's amazing to watch. She did it great in that movie, Christine. Um, and she does it here again. And this movie is just a much better version of that. I'm movie. intrigued. I'll and so, it. yeah, it was it was so good. And it's so worth a watch. And also, stop fucking copying me, Rebecca Hall. You should have made Empty <laughs> Space together. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a good one. Go check it out. Josh, what's your number one film of the year? Oh, can you guess? Speaking of A24. Uh, I can guess that it's the real answer is uh, Ant-Man or whatever fucking... <laughs> the the Black Widow. Now, yeah, it's got to be the Green Knight. Sir Gawain and the Green fucking Knights. Yeah, everyone likes the Green Knight. I liked it. I thought it was good. I, you know what? The problem with me and the Green Knight is it's just the retelling of the Green Knight story. I mean, <laughs> yes, cool. But, but I, you know what I, I, I like about? I mean, obviously, I like the whole movie. Um, you know, how you talk about how, um, you know, some movies are for the big screen, some movies are for like the small screen. I feel like the 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 right movie can make you feel like you're in the theater at home. And this is one of those movies that did it for me. Portrait of a Lady on Fire was another one, you know, I watched, you know, back in 2020. It was on my list then. It's just like, ah, you just, it's like you feel like you're in a theater just watching it because it's like, I don't know. I mean, it's super slow and meandering, but in a good way, I would say. Almost like um, Apocalypse Now, where it's just like, oh, this is like a long journey. And this is just kind of the pitfalls along the way and the ending to the journey, like you don't, it's coming and it's foreboding in a sense. And it's just great imagery. It's, it's another movie you could just put on and just have on because it's just every, like every shot looks good. And, um, well, yeah, one of I mean, the it's, things I really liked about the green Knight is that he, um, 
like in a lot of these movies especially when they're like oh it's a it's an artistic re retelling they'll have like the one supernatural thing and then nothing else will be supernatural and i really liked that um so much of this movie is supernatural it just it gets more like magical as it goes on in a yeah, sense like, yeah like those giants and stuff and like there's just so much and i also like i mean just like the fact that he dresses up arthur as um as uh as jesus pretty much like they ha they have very similar looks and then he dresses up uh the guy's mother uh mordana he dresses her up as uh the virgin mary it's like you see the iconology and like the way things are going and i think that that it's just really smart every move that he makes yeah and it also like it, it definitely like one of those things too where it keeps throwing you for a loop in a sense like there's like a, a part early on where it's just like it shows him like tied up and like robbed and then it just cuts to his bones and it like cuts back to him freaking out, like imagining his own bones. <laughs> like, yeah, and it's like, like, it's almost like comical in a sense or like he, he like meets a ghost that just kind of nags him a bit to like help her out. Um, so it's like, it's always like something, I don't know. Yeah, it's just a series of like ridiculous circumstances. He's just kind of reacting to, you know? It has a very like lived in feel to it where um like when you see them, you kind of like or like the way he interacts with things, you can tell that this is just part of their world. And yeah. it, it just really works. And like Dev Patel is such a good actor that he's able to like sell it really well. And so yeah, there's there's no wrong there's no wrong parts of that movie. It's so good. Yeah. Yeah, it's I loved it. Just the the tracking shot of him leaving, and it just like stays on him for like several minutes as he's like riding out of Camelot. Ugh. Yeah, I also really like. Um, I like when I was watching it, and he fights the the Green Knight and cuts off his head. I was like, oh yeah, I do know what story this is. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those. I was like, oh, did I read this back in like grade school? You know, and it's just like, oh yeah, I've never actually seen any other film adaptations. But I've definitely read this story. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I just think, like, yeah, it's really well done. I did kind of forget that it came out this year. Thanks. Yeah, it's super early on in the year, too. Um, but, no, it was real good, and I, I really liked it. I think it's a good movie to end on. So, yeah, this year was a little, a little different. Dude. There was a lot of movies that kind of came out at the end of the year that felt like... Um, they like really kind of brought it home. And I think like at the beginning of the year, you had a lot of movies that were, you were scared if they were actually going to be good or not. Or like they were scared to release them in a way. And so I think that this year, like it was definitely a lot better. And I, I, I'm really excited for next year, especially if empty space is on there. Cause that's going on my list. Cause I'm a narcissist. <laughs> you but, can't do yeah. that. Good job, guys. Good job, movies. Except for you, Rebecca Hall, for copying me. Um, yeah, good job to uh, director of The Green Knight, David Lowry. I always want to say it like he's Mike Lowry from Bad Boys. Did he make The Lighthouse? No, that was the other guy. Um, yeah, did The Witch. Ari Aster. Was it Ari Aster? No, Ari Aster no. did Hereditary and Solmar. I just, I'm just getting all my 24 guys mixed up. It was, no, it was David something, though, for The Lighthouse. Now I'm going to look it up. Robert Eggers, I was completely wrong. Yeah, good job. Um. <laughs> so, that was definitely on my top three of that year, though. So just go watch The Lighthouse is, is my... Oh, he did a ghost story, which is another great film. No, oh, I love a ghost I did story. Like, yeah. I did like a ghost story more, because that one feels like a remake of 2001. Uh, we'll get to it eventually. But yeah. Good year, guys. More Venoms. We need more Venoms in the world. Um, so that was our list. Tell us what yours was, and we'll see you guys next week when we get back into regular movies. Um, maybe it'll be something fun. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll be something uh, not fun. I don't know. We'll see. But thanks, guys. We'll talk to you later.